Senator, uh, Assemblymember Bonilla. You have two bills before us. Item 2, AB 63. And uh, item is 17. it all right if I uh, start with 1101? I have 11, a witness okay. that uh, needs to AB go. AB 1101, item 17. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair and members. Um, I'm pleased to present to you AB 1101, which provides critical safeguards for students and families and school districts um, through a very collective and transparent process. We know that there's always an issue uh, at school districts with um, some families trying to send their schools to districts in which they uh, aren't living. Um, and in no way does this bill um, seek to allow um, the improper uh, enrollment of students in districts where they do not reside. However, it's come to our attention, and I have a witness here today that will speak about uh, a case that happened within uh, my region. Uh, sometimes there uh, is an overreach. And so what this bill really seeks to do, uh, more than anything, is say every school district needs to adopt a policy um, in their school board meeting that is in the open meeting setting so that all the families know what the investigation policy is for that district. I think that's very, very important for all the families to have that information. Um, there are a few other details uh, to uh, the policy that are in the bill, and the Senate Education Committee analysis suggests that the prohibition on surreptitious photographing of students be clarified. So we do have a mock-up that will be handed out to you that makes it um, very specific, and I would like to take an author's amendment to include this definition of surreptitious in the bill. And it's defined as prohibiting the covert collection of both photographic and videographic images of person or places subject to investigation. The collection of images is not covert if the technology is used in open and public view. Uh, and really, it, with that definition, we're, we're trying to make sure that the districts can accomplish the work they need to accomplish and have the evidence that they may need to collect, but at the same time protect the privacy of the families and also protect young students uh, from the idea of people hiding in bushes and uh, sneaking around corners and, and taking pictures of them. I think most of us who maybe have children or grandchildren would, would have a level of discomfort with the fact that perhaps without our knowledge at all, uh, there could be somebody um, snapping pictures of, of young children coming in and out of, of the, the household. Uh, also, the bill requires a school district to adopt a policy uh, that includes these um, uh, factors, and that is a requirement that they make reasonable efforts to determine whether the student resides in the school district, district uh, whether or not a school district will be employing the services of a private investigator. There's no prohibition. We just want families to know if that's the approach the district's taking. And a requirement that all employees or contractors identify themselves truthfully to individuals um, contacted or interviewed during the course of the investigation. And uh, with the testimony, you'll see why that's very important. Uh, and we feel that that's a, a very honest way to deal uh, with the families who put their trust um, in our public education uh, system. I believe this bill will create transparency and disclosure uh, for student residency investigations. I, I believe we're going to leave schools with all the tools they need. Uh, we're just uh, having better communication around how they're going to use those tools. We have great examples. There's some school districts, Fremont, uh, Pleasanton in strong support, Pittsburgh Unified in support. There are really good ways to get this job done of making sure that our students are going where they need to go. Um, but we believe this bill will help some districts that perhaps haven't gotten to that place of an established policy uh, of really including their stakeholders in the process of doing that. With me today, I have um, Miriam Storch from Arinda, the employer of Maria, whose child Vivian, a second grader, was subjected to a private investigation and incorrectly determined not to reside in the district at really great um, uh, trauma to her family. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and committee members. Thank you for allowing me to, this opportunity to tell you about our encounter with a private investigator who was hired by our public school district. My name is Miriam Storch. Most of you already know our story, where a un Arinda Union School District conducted a secret one-sided investigation in order to build the case that our nanny, uh, Maria, and her child, Vivian, did not meet the district's residency requirements. They have since relented and reinstated Vivian's enrollment, but the trauma of the experience remains with us. A private investigator hired by Arinda School District approached Maria in the dark of night and falsely identified himself as an insurance investigator who worked for AAA. 
He pointed to Maria's car. He referenced a specific intersection where she frequently travels. He said she had been in a car accident and wanted to discuss it with her. Maria was completely bewildered. She has never so much as gotten a traffic ticket. The investigators' tactics not only confused Maria, but terrified her. She lay awake at night for weeks, wondering if her ex-husband was trying to track her down. She wondered if she and her child were in danger. We all did. When we learned that the private investigator worked for our local school district, we were both shocked and strangely, strangely, strangely relieved. But as time went on, we were infuriated that a public school district, an entity whose sole purpose is to serve children and families, would employ someone who uses such deceptive and underhanded techniques is appalling. Taxpayer money should not be used to fund outright trickery and deception. Criminals are afforded more rights and better due process in investigations conducted by law enforcement. Thank you for considering this critical bill, which will ensure that a basic level of decency and dignity are upheld in future investigations for all families. I urge you to vote aye on AB 1101. Thank you. Others in support? Madam Chair and members, my name is Shireen Walter, and I am here today representing the over 800,000 members of the California State PTA, the Parent Teacher Association, in support of AB 1101. As the largest child advocacy association working exclusively on behalf of children, PTA supports parental choice within the public school system, defined as giving parents the right to select their children's schools from among the range of possible options. It is important that parents, though, follow local school district rules when exercising their parental school choice. Schools, on the other hand, must be able to investigate suspected cases of residency fraud, but need to do so after they have developed district policies on the investigation of student residency and that they do so in a manner that supports the safety and the privacy of the students. Perhaps the most important of the requirements in AB 1101 is prohibiting the surreptitious photographing of pupils being investigated. S safeguards need to be put in place in order to ensure that our school-aged children, especially elementary school-aged children, are not photographed in secret. Children's privacy must be protected. This bill will help make sure that during a student residency investigation, our youth are safe from deceitful tactics used by private investigators. The California State PTA respectfully requests your I vote on AB 1101. Thank you. Thank you. Others in support? Madam Chair and Senator Seth Bramble here on behalf of more than 300,000 members of the California Teachers Association. We agree with the author that there's a need for more transparency and disclosure uh, with respect to student residency investigations and also for due process in challenging a student's home residency. We urge your support. Thank you. Others in support? Good morning, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, Ron Rapp with the California Federation of Teachers speaking in support of AB 1101. We believe AB 1101 will bring greater transparency and fairness to the investigative process. We also believe this bill will help to protect students from private investigators who may use invasive and fraudulent methods when conducting investigations on parents and students in residency cases. And for these reasons, we respectfully ask for an I vote. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Others in support? Others in opposition to the bill? Please come forward. Good morning, Madam Chair, members. Good to be with you again. This is Nancy Chaitis Espinosa with the California School Boards Association. Um, I'm going to attempt to have a little bit more of a fact-based conversation. We've heard some really uh, emotional language. And I will begin by pointing you to the committee's own analysis of the bill, the statement of the need for the bill. If you look just at the facts, even in what some of us may consider the worst case scenario of uh, applying this, this statute, um, the process worked. The district conducted an investigation. It came to a decision. It shared that information with the family. It stood corrected. It changed its decision and ultimately made the right decision. But what I think is really critical here is that we broaden our context. This bill would not just affect the situation that brought this issue to, to light for the author. Um, it would affect the entire state. So let's 
let's please consider this bill um, with that in mind. The typical situation is very different from the one that we've seen in Orinda. It's uh, much more sophisticated families who are um, who, who trigger these investigations. It's much more common that it be related to sports, that people want to get their students into the right district and the right school for uh, purposes of getting athletic scholarships, things of that nature. So um, in the universe in which a school district may need to conduct a residency investigation, it's typically a very different situation than the one that we've seen. So I just wanted to make sure that um, we all start with that frame in mind. Um, so current law defines pupil residency requirements and regulations actually require school districts to verify pupil residency every single year. Um, so we've talked a lot about, I, I think there's been, again, colorful language kind of uh, trying to get at motivations of a district for conducting these residency investigations. I want to make very clear it's actually our responsibility to do that. Um, there are a few provisions of the bill that are a problem for us. The provision requiring the board to adopt a specified policy, uh, I don't think we have a concern with, with the fact of the board uh, creating a specified policy to address this. It's really the specific requirements and the level of detail that it goes into. So uh, specific articulable facts, I think a lot of us learned a new word with articulable, um, is a little bit of a problem. And you know, I, I'm scratching my head a little bit when some of my colleagues with CTA and CFT are in support of this bill. I fear that they have not thought through the implications of this. Um, this language may require the district to identify the individuals, the district employees, who may have uh, triggered the investigation. So by um, not allowing the district to conduct, to protect confidentiality, um, that's a problem for anyone who may provide information to the district, be they a district employee, be they a community member. Once the word is out in the community that if you participate in this kind of investigation, if you give an honest answer to someone from the district who is coming to ask you questions about a student's residency, um, that your identity will not be protected, that spreads pretty quickly. So that will seriously impair our ability to gather uh, honest information from people. Um, second. Uh, the, the requirement that anyone who is conducting this type of investigation, be it the district employee or someone working on behalf of the district, divulge the fact of the investigation um, is a problem for us. There, there is a benefit when you're conducting an investigation to being able to gather all of your facts and then sharing them with the family. The reason for that is that um, people may not be truthful with you. So the family, the parents, members of the community, if it's an aunt, an uncle, and we're borrowing their address to enroll in what we think is a better district, all of these people are very well-intentioned. And if it's clear to them that um, it, it's in their hands to lie and do what they think is in the best interest of their student, they will commonly do that. Um, when you put that together with the fact that the list of documents that statute specifies that districts have to use as evidence for residency, uh, are very easy to falsify. It's very easy to get a fake address onto those legal documents. Um, we are left with uh, photographic evidence. So this bill would actually prohibit us from using photography or video. So once the district goes through its process, either sends a letter or sits down and has an in-person meeting with the family, um, commonly uh, the, the parents will, will stick to their story. They'll continue to say, no, no, no. This is where we live. This is where Junior lives. He lives with his aunt, whatever the story is. Um, and it's only the photography and the video that allow everyone to, to come to a consensus about what the real situation is. So absent this very critical investigative tool, we are effectively uh, unable to verify student residency in, this, in these situations as the law requires us to do. Um, and you know, uh, we've talked a little bit, the, the author um, suggested an amendment to actually define what the word surreptitious is, and I understand um, the, the analysis represents that the bill doesn't prohibit photography, that it prohibits surreptitious photography, um, which, which could be defined. Um, I think any kind of photography that we need uh, for an investigative purpose could be described as surreptitious, even with the proposed definition. So what we need is a photograph that shows a student going into a specified location. Um, and it, it's difficult to capture all of that information if you're standing you know, five feet away. So ideally, we would have to be um, uh, maybe across the street, or across the street you know, behind a bush apparently is a problem, but 
What about next to a bush? Um, according to the definition that is proposed here by the author, uh, it, it's still unclear because uh, what's the right distance? You know, could you be uh, two houses down? Could you be half a block away? What is the definition of surreptitious and what is the definition of covert according to the proposal? Um, it would introduce actually a greater level of confusion opening up our districts to liability and, and impeding our ability to do our, do our job to implement this, uh, implement this code section. So um, with that, uh, I, I understand the situation. I ask of you to please not, um, not assume that some of, our, uh, some of our, I guess, worst case scenario stories are actually typical of what's happening across the state. And, and please bear in mind um, the, the good actors, which is everybody else who is trying to implement this law and, and uh, don't impede our ability to do that. So we respectfully oppose. Others in opposition to the bill. Yes, Senator, thank you. Uh, my name is Francie Kaler. I'm representing the private investigator view. Maria's story is troubling at best. Uh, it's troubled us as well. Uh, if the news reports are correct, there were three, invest three separate investigation companies that were hired because evidently the first one who I actually spoke to um, came up with unverifiable information and so that wasn't accepted and two other firms were uh, were hired then. So we appreciate the clarification that the language regarding covert video, video or photographic evidence addresses. However, we're very concerned about the requirement of collection of images in open and public view. That seems to us right there to violate the privacy of the child. The, uh, it could be scary to the child. It could be frightening to those other children that may be with the child or the parents. So having them, uh, having an open and public view photograph seems counterproductive uh, to us. The, if the objectives of this legislation are to protect pupils from being disturbed or alarmed while still providing effective pupil residency investigations, this bill really fails to address either goal. They could be disturbed if the investigator is required to identify themselves. An investigation could be hampered. For instance, if you're doing a due diligence in a neighborhood, and maybe these are relatives, maybe these are neighbors, typically the neighbors know what's going on, is my experience, and at least in my neighborhood, my neighbors know a lot. And so going to that neighbor and saying, I'm representing the school district, and I'm checking on the, ver the pupil residency of this child going to this school, that's going to get right back to the parents, which is, again, counterproductive. Um, this bill applies to one very unusual situation. If the news reports are to be correct, it was handled badly. We agree. Um, but we do believe that privacy of the individual should be protected. Nobody else should know what's going on. The investigator is required to keep all information of investigations confidential. Any images or investigations or ga facts they gather only goes back to their client. It can't go anywhere else. That's pro prohibited by our Private Investigator Act. Private investigators are licensed by the state. We have to work 6,000 hours to qualify for a state exam. We have to pass an FBI and DOJ background check and then take a test in order to qualify. There are laws that prohibit us, our PI Act, privacy laws, any laws regarding stalking, other state laws apply to us. We're like all of you. We have to comply with all of the laws. We don't get any exceptions to those. So with all of these things, uh, it seems to me that this bill looks through the lens of someone who has, has been found in compliance, as Maria's family was. Private investigators look through a lens of gathering facts and determining the truth and taking that information back to their client. So um, it, there's significant cost to a school district where a child is attending out of, out of district. This is actually called fraud if it's done with, without authorization. And people who typically commit fraud aren't not going to be forthcoming with their information. So with all of that, uh, I ask you to respectfully oppose this bill. Others in opposition. Yes, my name is Roberto Rivera. Um, I'm a licensed pri private investigator, um, and I'm also a, uh, a residency officer for a public school district. Uh, almost exclusively since 2007, I've conducted residency investigations. 
um, I can say that phot photographic and video evidence um, is, is very essential in conducting these types of investigations. Uh, we are often challenged uh, by, uh, by parents uh, to provide documentation, irrefutable documentation that we are, dis that, that uh, we have evidence that their student is residing outside and it's, it is the correct student um, uh, because they are of a young age. Um, I've conducted um, th th these types of investigations for multiple districts. I can say that um, often these, these are very, um, very difficult types of investigations and also very sensitive because we are dealing with children. I have children myself. I know every year, um, I, uh, not one year goes by before, without seeing a Craigslist ad um, in my area uh, where uh, somebody's actually uh, proposing to sell their address uh, for to, in order to attend to school within, within the right school district. Um, I just would say, uh, as somebody who, who believes in the integrity um, and the confidentiality of, of these types of investigations, uh, I would uh, strongly, uh, strongly urge uh, to be opposed. Thank you. Any others in opposition to the bill? Any questions from members? Senator Leva. Good morning. I had a question that you said you were the superintendent, is that correct? Uh, no. Who do I represent? Yes. California School Boards Association. Thank you. So I just want to kind of, if you will, walk me through what happens. So when you believe that a child is not residing in the home that has been listed, do you talk to the parents first and give them the opportunity to respond? I know you said that usually they're dishonest, but do you give them the opportunity to first respond? Uh, that's my first question. Second question is, do you ever go to the home, knock on the door, and see if the child is there? So, well, first I want to clarify, I hope I didn't say usually they're dishonest. Sometimes they're dishonest. Um, it's handled in, in different ways, but generally the process is that something has triggered the reason to believe that the student doesn't meet the residency requirements. That could be, uh, maybe you have documents that have different addresses. Maybe an individual gave you some information, something like that. Um, so uh, you will gather whatever information that you have. Um, depending on the circumstances, um, if uh, I think the typical situation, uh, like, like what happened in Orinda, I think the way it would typically be handled is that someone would speak to the family. Um, in this case, clearly, as was stated, it, it was not handled well. Um, if there is a reason to believe that there is um, a, a more, I could say, intentional deceit, like the, the more typical situation with athletics, um, you would probably want to gather your photographic and video evidence before uh, letting the family know that you have a concern. And the reason for that is because it's very important not to give uh, people a, an opportunity to make temporary changes in their behavior that would keep you from getting an accurate picture of what's happening. But yes, typically you gather your information, you talk to the family, and that's the point at which you uh, will make a final decision. Thank you. The, the reason I ask is because accidents do happen. Things, nice. as in the case here in Orinda, and if you went to the parent first, I understand why you don't want to go to the parent first, but if you went to the parent first, if you knocked on the door, I think that people who are innocent, people who haven't done anything wrong, it would protect them more. Um, when my children were in school, one of my daughters, uh, she was 11, and we knock on the door one day, and there's a police officer and the principal of their school, and they were going to take her away for truancy. And they said, why isn't she in school today? And I said, well, she's on track three, and track three is off. Wow. And they said, oh, well, she missed 10 days of school. I said, that is correct. She was in Holland with her father, which yeah. was all cleared through the district yeah. and uh, through the school, but the paperwork had not been filed properly. Um, little miracle, I was home that day. I should have been at work. The babysitter should have been there. Had the babysitter been there, they would have put her in the back of a police car and taken her uh, to the police department and mm -hmm. charged her with truancy. Mm -hmm. So I just think sometimes it's better to get, and I understand why you're doing it the way you do it, because you're, you're, you're doubting the person. So you're, you're, you're starting from a point of reasonable doubt rather than a point of innocence. Mm -hmm. And I think that the innocent people can be protected, the parents who are doing the right thing, and maybe the school district has gotten the wrong information, they can be protected uh, so we can avoid situations uh, that happened in Orinda. So just a comment. Sure. Any other, uh, Senator Monning? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
clearly the the case that triggered this everyone's expressed their concern of how that investigation was conducted for the private investigators is it standard practice to misrepresent uh, the purpose of your presence on somebody's property this this investigator saying he was a car insurance reviewer um, I've heard anecdotally that people will use that in serving a warrant um, they'll use subterfuge is that legal and ethical in your business practice I'll answer that yes um, it's a catch-22 um, I personally don't like the way the, the representation in this situation to say you were representing an insurance company but to um, to not identify your real purpose for being there would be a common practice because it's not anybody else's business for example it's not the neighbors or the relatives business what you're doing so if you can uh, come up with something that is um, applicable to the situation where you're not identifying for instance going to them and saying I'm working on behalf of the school district is not going to work I mean it's just not going to work I don't have any problem with identifying the investigator identifying themselves to the family specifically but anybody outside that family it's not their business so we are always in a catch-22 um, you know people who commit fraud don't give you truthful answers so you have to come up with a way to get those answers without impersonating somebody else impersonating a company but just by giving them a story perhaps that will get, get the information from them yeah I, I appreciate the candor of that response but I, I could see circumstances where the misrepresentation to a neighbor while it may seem more benign could also leave the neighbor thinking my neighbor's been involved in a hit-and-run car accident or some other is, is under investigation for some other um, uh, transgression so uh, I agree and and that's why you have to be very careful uh, it would be um, maybe more appropriate to say you were conducting a survey or something like that and that nothing where you're implicating that this person uh, has done something wrong right. And then it seems the amendments that are suggested about um, uh, one of the goals, and I'll direct this question to the author, is to try to eliminate the covert collection of information, the, the person with the camera hiding in the bushes, or right. would that include a telephoto lens from spelling. a great distance away? Um, no, it, it states it would be open and public view. And so it, it, I think we were trying to make sure that we understood the importance of photographic evidence. Um, and uh, no, it, just as long as you're out in the open and public, it, it does not prohibit that. So I, I, really, I personally believe that there could be a number of photographs and videos taken, um, you know, standing across the street or standing wherever you want. It doesn't say that there's no distance in here. There's, it's very wide open. Um, and I think the point is just that uh, it, it should be transparent um, and open. Thank you. And then a final question, if I might, of the, the, the school districts. Um, is it grounds to suspect a student's um, residency status based on their race or ethnicity? Emphatically, no. It is not. Um, and uh, that's, that's really the point I wanted to make, that we step back from the situation that happened in Orinda to really consider the way school districts operate across the state. Um, no, it is, it is never grounds to do that. Um, if I may address your, your previous question, um, the issue of, of harm, whether there is any harm to students with conducting the, the photography. So uh, it, it sounds very benign to say photography would take place in open and public view. Um, I, I am actually concerned that that would be harmful to students. That is much scarier for a young child to have an individual um, in open and public view taking pictures of them or if they're not able to take pictures of them, having to talk to them and ask them questions when it's a grown-up that they don't know, the result of this bill will result in, in harm to students. Current law, which allows uh, an adult to be uh, at a safe distance where a child will not see them, avoids that harm. Okay, any other questions or comments? All right. Um, 
Ms. Bonilla, would you like to address some of the concerns your opposition has that they've enumerated? Um, they had many, I guess. Um, <laughs> I think that, uh, uh, first of all, I believe at the local school board meeting with the families in that district, this is a really wonderful discussion to have. And that's what this bill fundamentally does. It says, go to your families at a board meeting, allow them to come and speak about what they want to um, have happen. Many districts don't even use private investigators. Uh, Pleasanton, Fremont, the ones I mentioned, don't even employ them. They just have a district employee that might do a home visit. And honestly, that's how most of these cases get resolved. Um, so I think that, um, you know, to, to uh, the point of the bill, it, it really is about um, making sure that families know what's happening and then on the, on the back end that there is due process in the case of the fact that there's a mistake made or an appeal wants to, a family wants to appeal. And that just is a policy that needs to be adopted. I believe that's the role of the school board. Um, I believe that there are many best practices out there. I think that a quick survey of what other districts are doing would answer all of the questions that have been brought forward today because there's many districts who are being very successful in um, making sure that fraud is found out and doesn't happen uh, without um, using some of these methods. Okay. All right. We'll use that as your close. Thank you. All right. Is there... A I will move the, move the bill, if I could just comment. Um, as the bill moves forward, because I believe it goes to appropriations, does it not? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Um, I, no, I would no, encourage no. people to keep working on some of the no. finer points of this, whether pictures are taken no. um, in full view or across the street seems to me something that we can deal with and, um, and, and, and perhaps should to fine tune it. I think the basic <coughs> approach that yes, this should be a discussion in school districts. I find it amazing that school districts would employ private investigators using their scarce resources <laughs> to exclude children unless they're so oversubscribed but I actually have several districts that we know have students from all over the district that go to those schools. And honestly, people just look the other way unless there's a real misbehavior or that student becomes a drain on the resources of the school. Um, I, I just don't know what to make of all of this, frankly. Um, it seems like misplaced priorities to me. And we do want to send, I think, a message to districts uh, that would go to such lengths as to take three different private investigators <laughs> that perhaps this should be a public discussion of school policy and priorities. So I would... Uh, urging people to continue to work on those fine points, which I do understand, um, I would move the bill. Thank you, um, Senator Hancock. Just for clarification, this bill is not, is, is not fiscal, so it, it will be going to the floor. Oh, well. Okay. All right, so the bill has been moved, um, and I would agree with um, Senator Hancock that uh, it's good for school districts to consider this in terms of a policy and have this community discussion. So with that, let's call the roll. Oh, with the amendments? Yeah, as amended. Okay, with as amended. All right. Do pass as amended to the floor. Lou? Aye. Lou, aye. Renner? Aye. Renner, aye. Block? Hancock? Aye. Hancock, aye. Leva? Aye. Leva, aye. Mendoza? Monning? Aye. Monning, aye. Pan? Pan, aye. Bidak? Six. Okay, you have six votes sufficient for passage. Uh, we'll keep the roll open for absent members.